Um, one of the first things is if someone, if, if you're, you or the attending thinks somebody needs to have a surgical consult, don't let them eat and don't write consult surgery, regular diet, Lovenox, <laughs> in those order. Uh, wait till, we're, till we have at least been notified to clear them before they can eat. Uh, drainage of perirectal abscesses are notorious for that or somebody comes in and, and gets fully anticoagulated on Lovenox or whatever and, and our hands are tied. Even if we need to operate, we really can't. So I know that's sort of common sense, but I, I, uh, you, a lot of times we just get in habits of writing orders and we write our, you know, admit to somebody uh, or whatever, diet, because it, it prompts you to write a diet and you just write a regular diet. But uh, if, if the thought of surgery comes in, please, and I'll shut up, but please uh, th don't let them eat or give them any anticoagulant until after, at least until we've been notified and, and okay everything, if that's okay. But as far as an acute abdomen, um, if, some, if, if somebody comes into your office and say they had belly pain, obviously the history and physical is going to be the most important thing you can do right off the bat. If it's an acute onset of pain, that's a lot more uh, worrisome than something that's been going on for six months. You know, if they've been having weight loss or, if, or not having weight loss, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, the, if they've been taking uh, steroids, if they've been taking non-steroidals, if they've had a history of ulcer disease, um, their age, uh, all these things you start thinking about, the age group's probably going to point you more in one direction or the other. Somebody that's young, you're going to start thinking, well, they might have appendicitis or a torsed ovary or something like that. Um, uh, or gallbladder disease even, uh, as, as, a, uh, as opposed to somebody in their uh, later in years, uh, middle age or later, and they got a lot of health issues and been on uh, non-steroidals for a hip replacement or whatever, and, and the acute onset of pain that awoke them at two in the morning, you, you think more of a bowel perforation from an ulcer or something like that. Um, so you know the, the history. The history in your physical exam is going to be the most important thing you do. Uh, and when you when you go to exa examine them, or let me back up. When you're talking to them about the history, when they're riding in the car, or somebody's bringing them to your office or to the hospital or whatever, um, the certain things exacerbate the pain. Hitting bumps. Uh, when they're riding in the wheelchair, there's right, somebody's driving them here, and came through or, or down a, a road that was bumpy and they were screaming and yelling in pain, they'll remember that. But if you ask them if, what, you know, what makes it worse, you know, any kind of jarring, coughing, sneezing, anything like that, that's gonna give you, that's gonna lead you in a, uh, one direction. Uh, that how severe it is and how important what's going on is right now. Um, if, if it's acute onset, uh, other than just a perforation, you have to think about acute ischemia, because ischemia is, uh, is one of the most serious things you definitely don't want to miss. If they have uh, pain out of proportion to exam, that's, that's the classic de uh, definition of ischemic bowel pain. Uh, if you can press on the belly, but they're writhing in pain, writhing's not a good word. That's more kidney stones or bili biliary colic. Or, but, um, but if they're, they're pain, they're, you can tell they have a lot of discomfort and on exam, it's not that significant. Um, but say if you're in the, uh, the hospital and you're seeing somebody in the ER, you're gonna, by the time I see them, they've already got blood work, CAT scans, and x-rays done, you know, EKGs to make sure it's not MIs and all that. So usually it's pretty, when I go see them, it's already been sort of, uh, I guess, tunneled down to me to make it come to surgery. Um, but, but you have to think about all the different things that can cause pain. Uh, and, you know, did they get a spider bite? I mean, because black, uh, black widows can cause belly pain. Uh, they let, having lead toxicity, you know, that's all esoterical things can cause severe abdominal pain. 
that's the things that you need to, if, if everything else checks out, you start going down your algorithm, what's causing it? They, you know, well, are they crazy? A lot of people are crazy, but, or they want pain medicine. Yeah, that's, that's probably high, highest on the list in our, in our society today um, for somebody that doesn't have a surgical problem. Um, they want something, or somebody to just listen to them talk, or they're craving attention. I mean, you have to, you know, when you're assessing them, talking to them, you, you'll get a feel, hopefully, that what's going on. Because usually, um, if you listen to the patient, I'm not the one that came up with this, he'll tell you what's wrong with them. Uh, Sir Henry, Henry Osler is a primary care doctor in the 1800s. In his book, Internal Medicine, that's what it was in there. <laughs> Um, but if you listen to them, they'll, they'll point you in the right direction as a rule and tell you what's wrong. You, it's your job to sort of figure out and, you know, treating it, you, you can train, if I can do it, you can train a monkey to do it. So as far as surgery, you can do a procedure and fix whatever you can fix. But, um, but y'all's job is harder and that y'all got to weed through all the folks that are a little bit on the, uh, Psychiatric issues or whatever, to find the ones that actually have actually have a surgical problem. Um, the um, but once once you've had the CAT scans, ultrasounds, urine, because uh, if somebody's having just severe abdominal pain, but they're not that tender, then I always think about urinary tract because usually they are writhing in pain. If you've ever seen anybody with had the kidney stone. Uh, polynephritis, that kind of thing, it gets your attention. Because um, uh, obviously the tre treatment for kidney stones is not by me, it's by urologist and hydration and pain medicine and so forth, flush the kidney stone out or get a stand in or whatever you got to do. But uh, as far as the um, uh, pilo, obviously that's antibiotics and, and a U UA should pick that up and a good physical exam. Uh, but the um, I don't know if you want me to go over all the, the operations we do for acute appendicitis or when do we not, not operate on appendicitis, that might be a good option, a good thing to talk about. Um, if somebody has had a long set of abdominal pain and they're uh, stubborn, didn't want to go to the hospital, wouldn't listen to the family, and been hurting for a week, two weeks, and they had fever, they had all the classic symptoms of uh, appendicitis, and they sort of sort of stabilized, but they still are having pain or running f more fever, that kind of thing, or having trouble, nausea, vomiting, and so forth. They finally come to the, to the ER, and you get a cat, they get a CAT scan, and it shows uh, contained perforation around the appendix. Um, well, the, the, a lot of people, include myself back years ago we just operate on them and that's not the right thing to do now we found that if you can drain the abscess you can get the, the infection under control let them get well come back and do an interval appendectomy on them after the infection's resolved it's a lot safer you don't have to take out half the colon in the middle of the night for the, for that which sometimes if you're there for the uh, for a contained perforation with a phlegmine you'd have to do that um, you know, if you have perforated viscous, uh, whether it's because it can happen from various or sundry reasons, from a chicken bone, a fish bone, ulcer disease, uh, tumor, uh, diverticulitis, necklace diverticulitis, uh, intussusception, small bowel obstruction with obstruction. Um, that turns gangrenous, all those things can lead to a free air and perforation. And the treatment of them is more surgical and that probably don't really uh, matter to y'all as much, but um, the, the, uh, but at least we'll get started work to get them fixed, uh, whatever. The, um, other uh, sources of abdominal pain, acute abdominal pain, that, uh, you know, PID, uh, GYN etiology, endometriosis, 
those kind of things. You, you have to always think about the outliers or the, the common things do occur commonly. A ruptured ovarian cyst to get a young lady's attention real quick. And, um, and it's very painful, but usually it, it resolves fairly quickly. Um, sometimes if you have a torsed ovary, that, that's, that's a big deal. You gotta fix that, you gotta get that fixed, otherwise the ovary's gonna have to come out. Um, fortunately, I don't do that, but that, we see that from time to time. Or uh, get asked to see somebody with abdominal pain and, it, and it, it's more of an ovarian issue than uh, a general surgery issue. But um, now as far as the uh, the, the, again, the treatment probably doesn't matter as much to y'all as, as how to work them up. Um, so you've done your history and physical, you have an idea of which way to go, then you uh, look at the light year labs or whatever at labs you want to order. If, uh, if you got uh, gallbladder disease and they're having severe pain, you want to make sure they don't have pancreatitis because biliary pancreatitis is uh, it's a life-threatening condition, uh, typically. Uh, it can be. Tw uh, I was told when I was in residency that 20% of your first episodes of, first episode of pancreatitis was, was uh, fatal. One in five. That's just crazy. Um, you'll see a lot of people come in with, a, uh, with severe acute on onset of uh, Abdominal pain, it's usually upper abdominal pain. A lot of people describe it as a band around the upper abdomen. Uh, they can't get comfortable. The reason being they're having a third degree burn inside their abdominal cavity. And so the peritoneum, very sensitive, is getting burned by the digestive enzymes turned loose by the pancreas. So um, that, is, that is really a, an emergency to sort that out real quickly. Um, there's not a surgery we do. We take the gallbladder out before they go home. We don't do it acutely. Uh, typically, you, the question should arise: Do we ha this patient need a stent in his bile duct to get him over the, or in his pancreatic duct potentially, to put the, get the pancreas to settle down? Um, and there's um, a lot of uh, IV fluids and sometimes pressors and all that needs to be used, but uh, trying to keep the patient alive till you can get to that point where you can get the gallbladder out so it doesn't happen again. That's my job is take the gallbladder out before they go home. Um, we would have to operate on pancreatitis. Typically if there's necrosis and a, a big abscess formed in the, the dead pancreas. Uh, fortunately that's not, not very, we don't have to do that very often. Uh, maybe once every five or six years in my experience. Um, I'm just going randomly, obviously, <laughs> through different disease processes. Um, so when you get your blood work back, the amylase is 5,000 or whatever, then you probably get a pretty good idea that you're dealing with pancreatitis. Uh, GI needs to be consulted because they can make a decision on if they have to have a stent put in their bile duct urgently in the middle of the night because um, that is really a pancreatitis is really a medical issue it's not a surgical issue uh, again we just take the gallbladder out before they go home so they don't have it happen again um, small bowel obstructions are a whole, whole nother issue I'm going to change uh, to that um, I'm sure y'all have all seen somebody come in had some abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, bloated. They thought they were constipated, so they took some laxatives at home, and now they're having diarrhea. And they came in because they're having abdominal pain. Well, if they're having diarrhea, they're not obstructed by definition, number one. Uh, they, something could else is going on, but it, they, they don't have a small bowel obstruction, typically. So they get a CAT scan. The CAT scan is going to show dilated loops of probably the stomach and small bowel is going to be dilated. And if you see a dilated small bowel all the way to the colon, then and the colon doesn't have air in it, then you have to think about a tumor or some obstruction at the ileocecal valve. Um, so you want to get GI involved in surgery involved in that case. Uh, pretty quickly. 
But if you typically the CAT scan will show for a small bowel obstruction, it'll show an area of dilated small bowel and an area of decompressed distal small bowel. And there'll be a transition point on the CAT scan somewhere in the GI tract in the small bowel, wherever it is. If it's from a hernia in the abdominal wall, uh, it'd be pretty obvious because they'll be complaining of pain in your abdominal wall. They'll have a knot out there that's probably turning red and angry and, and, and they won't let you touch it. <coughs> then that, that, yeah, for sure, that's a surgical emergency. Um, or in the groin, or, 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 but it, or in the, it could be inguinal or femoral. That's something I always think about. Uh, you want to check the whole groin area because there's a space next to the medial to the femoral vein, uh, and especially in females, that is the most common source of femoral, femoral uh, hernias. And typically they will get obstructed, and they're usually little thin, little 70, 80, 90 year old ladies uh, that get those. Um, but anyway, so you, but that would show up on the CAT scan. You should get a, a, that on the CAT scan. But if the CAT scan shows air all the way through the small bowel, and there's a lot of air in the colon, then that's something that most likely, and they're having diarrhea, then it's probably from taking medications, the laxatives, and they get, or gastroenteritis, or something along those lines. Um, the CAT scans overread small bowel obstruction significantly, but if you look at the CAT scan, they're reading what they see. There's a dilated area and a decompressed area. So by definition, there is a, there's something there, whether it's an adhesion or whatever. The good thing with small bowel obstructions, 80% of them are resolved with just an NG tube, uh, and probably more than that resolved we don't ever see because they just, if they're having pain and vomiting, they just chill for a day or two and don't don't eat or drink anything and they get better on their own. But if they present to the ER or whatever, um, you know, an NG tube will make them feel better pretty quickly and it'll protect their airway from aspiration. So if they come in, y'all get consulted and you get an NG tube, the ER doctor has put an NG tube in. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to order a flatten up right of the abdomen because that's old school. But it's not a CAT scan. They do an x ray with them laying down and, stand, and sitting up straight or standing up straight if they can do it. And that'll give you air fluid levels, and it's called stair step of air fluid levels that you can see that will uh, tell you you definitely got a small bowel obstruction. And, and it could be in the process that it could be getting better, it could be getting worse. If, you, if the CAT scan does not show any pneumatosis, air in the wall of the, of the bowel, then you, can, you have the leisure of time since they're decompressed with the NG tube to sit on them and let them try to get better without surgery. And again, 80% of them are resolved without surgery. So if, if the flatten upright that we do shows uh, that there is not, there's, they're not, not having much gas in their colon, then the first thing I'm gonna do after I do the flatten upright is I'm gonna get an upper GI small bowel series with gastrographin because a lot of times it'll, it'll, it'll force the issue one way or the other. So that way we can either go ahead and operate during daylight hours if, if it goes to, the, to a point and doesn't progress um, then it's our call to when we're going to operate because you're most likely going to have to. But I, typically, I, a lot of times I'll wait overnight if, if they're stable and not really tender. Um, I'll repeat uh, KUB in the, in the next day and see if the contrast has migrated on down to the colon because a lot of times it will. And when that gastrographin hits the colon, it's like taking a bowel prep uh, for a colonoscopy. Once it hits the colon, you're going to have diarrhea everywhere. And if they do, then great. They're not going to need surgery, most likely. Um, but if, if, it's, if, it's, if it does not show any progression of the contrast, then we need to operate, unless there's some reason we can't. Uh, at least we offer it anyway. Um, let's see what else. As far as... Um, I'm not going to go into spotter bites and lead toxicity. That's not really my cup of tea, but those things you just always need to think about uh, if somebody comes in with severe abdominal pain. Um, I 
Do y'all have any questions? So, just maybe a follow-up question. Uh, what is the as when we communicate with surgeons right. and we start communicating with them, we may have some issues. Like, how would you feel like it would be the best way like, to uh, inform you about a patient? How would you like to... Like, I use Tiger Text, and I, I appreciate that. And I, unfortunately, I set my ringtone to an Amber Alert. <laughs> so that was a bad choice on my... But it, it gets my attention. That's the only reason I did that. So I try, if, I'm, if I don't answer, it's not because I'm ignoring anybody, it's because I'm either operating or dead, one of the two. And usually I'm operating. Um, so if, 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 you try to call, if you try to contact me, if I don't get right back with you, I will as soon as I get free to where I can answer my phone. Um, but I, I appreciate that because I, I, like a, a patient in the hospital now, uh, somebody's got that, he uh, went home yesterday, I think. Anyway, I, I know a name to a name that I could connect with a patient, and so I could put some information in. This is what I think we ought to do, and that way I know we're, we're at least communicating. Because I know it's not convenient to run up and and track everybody down, uh, and I know I'm pretty busy, and it's hard to run me down a lot of times because I'm usually back in or 12 or 13 or somewhere the majority of the time, or I'm away from here, one of the two. <laughs> but uh, did I answer your question? Um, I was thinking more to what, like, the way we should uh, present to you the case. Oh, if, if, if you're asking me what I would do, I would say that we should have a conversation about the case. Uh, and if I would rather hear it in person. I mean, I'd rather, you know, if I, if you get, if I answer you, I would say let's just, let's talk. Um, you know, I'd say I'd call, I'd, a lot of times I'll just call right back on Tiger Voice or whatever. And uh, just talk to you, because uh, because that way it, it takes I'm old. It takes me too long to to text, but a lot, a, te a lot of little texts I'll do. But uh, it's just easier to communicate and and try to assess your concern for the patient. Like for example, uh, I think it was two days ago. Um, I I sent you a message that was with this patient with a foot ulcer. And it was me who texted you that because you were consulted by the ER doctor, but, and you recommend us to... Uh, podiatry, yeah, podiatry and vascular. So you know, the, when, when would a patient with diabetic foot ulcer would require like surgery consult? If, when they're ready to have an amputation. That's where we come in. Okay, so just like a, for an assessment plan, it actually won't make any difference? Uh, now, if, some, if you got a diabetic foot ulcer and they have air up their leg, they need the amputation. So if you see somebody has necrotizing fasciitis or they're septic and they got a red leg and it's got palpable crepidance in it, that's something we need to know about quickly. Um, have you ever felt crepidance? Yeah, you know, like popping those little bubbles and uh, packing, uh, shipping stuff. Yeah, if you ever feel that and you squeeze on somebody's leg, if it hurts, I'm sorry, but if you feel crepitance, that's a red flag. You need to know that, that because uh, that's very important. Because that they need, they're going to die if we don't take the leg off. Not my favorite operation, but it it saves lives. What else? I've rambled a lot, obviously. What about um, like a general advice on restarting diet? Sometimes we have this patient, they recently got a surgery, let's say like a cholera. Yeah. How, like how fast can we restart diet? I, I start them back, well, the ones we do as an outpatient, if they have acute cholecystitis, they have a necrotizing, uh, really sick necrotic gallbladder, I may keep them in their old or whatever. I may keep them on clear liquids and to, in the, for overnight. Uh, but usually, I, I, you will put them on clear liquids and advance their diet as they tolerate it. And I, if they've had pancreatitis, I'd probably put them on a low-fat diet for a week or two. But um, I, I advance their diet quickly. I really do. I think we all do, actually. So uh, I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. But usually, from we've already seen them, we operate on them, we, sh we should have written that for you, or written orders, not for you, for the patient.
you shouldn't have to worry about it. What else? Mm-hmm. What about cholangitis? Just a few lines on Oh, so what about and, uh, role of surgery in the the, for cholangitis? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, Asin and cholangitis. The um, if you have cholangitis, that's gonna you're gonna need a stent in that bile duct to drain it. Um, I can take the gallbladder out, but they're still going to have pus. They probably got a stone block in their bile duct. So the the right answer is really to decompress the bile duct somehow. Mm-hmm. If GI is not available, we could percutaneously drain the gallbladder if it's distended, because mm-hmm. uh, that would imply that the cystic ducts are open. So you should have a, a conduit between the bile duct and the gallbladder. Um, and if you percutaneously <coughs> drain the gallbladder, then you drain the bile duct indirectly. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, that they'll get sick real quickly, and uh, that's um, there's a triad. Uh, anyway, I won't go through all the list and all those different things. But uh, Reynolds pentad and Charcot's triad and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, people used to pimp us on as residents, but. Uh, Obviously, you want to cover antibiotics. You want to keep the blood pressure up, the urine output good, their O2 sat okay, um, and try to get GI to see them as soon as possible uh, to get the get the bile duct open. Basically, I have a continuation of our question because they had one of the patient in their team. So this, there was a female who had a history of cholecystectomy in the past. She was having recurrent CBD stones. Mm-hmm. She had undergone multiple uh, stents and there was a con- possibility of a cholangitis. So the next question is that when should we consider the possibility of doing a CBD exploration and putting the traditional T-tubes mm-hmm. or doing a bidefinitive procedure like cholecystectomy? I'm not laughing at you. We just don't have any T-tubes in this hospital. Oh, okay. They expired. Uh, it's rare that we have to do a common duct expiration. Right. One time we needed to do one in the middle of the night. We didn't have a tea tube. That was a nightmare. They had to call Keller to get one. But anyway, um, the I guess the uh, for somebody that has recurrent stones, I probably would send them to a hepatobiliary surgeon because they probably would best be served with uh, doing a cholecystectomy. Uh, get a big opening there, and, and that would de- decompress it uh, long term for them. We don't handle polydopagenos doing bypasses here, or we have to refer to the. Would, I would refer that to a hepatobiliary surgeon, probably in Birmingham or Nashville. I've, I was trained to do. We did a bunch of common duct explorations when I was a younger guy, yeah. but um, with the advent of ERCP and and their technology getting better with putting stents in, how good they are, it just we very rarely ever have to do them anymore. But I could do one right now if I needed to. I, I love that operation. It's fun. Um, but um, I've actually done a colidoco jejunostomy before. I mean, I've done Whipples before, but that doesn't mean I want to do them. And it's because the patients are sick after the surgery. The surgery's fun, but the post-op care is not too good. They get sick. And you need 24-7. Surgical so Yeah, yeah. What else you got? So, Dr. Bailey, any conditions or, red, or um, findings or red, red flags that we see in the ER, which in which you don't know, want, should we call you on, not tech, by your text, which is very urgent? If, to be honest with you, it doesn't hurt my feelings ever. I mean, I may sound gruff and angry and aggravated uh, when I'm awakened in the middle of the night because that's just my normal. Well, awake, awaken. But um, if you're you're concerned about a patient and need help, that's what we're here for. Um, I may huff and puff and all that, but it, it's not intended toward whoever is on the other end of the phone. It's until I get my cobwebs out of my head, and then uh, I start thinking about what's going on. And all my partners are the same way, I'm sure. So. Um, as far as if you're concerned about a patient, really no matter how trivi- trivial it actually may be, if um, if somebody that's there with
And um, since we all are together here, I want to give some um, tips and tricks to see if we can start practicing all of that. Although my project is just on 44 and 4500, but you can you know, do that on other floors, but this is where I'm mainly focused at. Out of the three interventions, one of my intervention is to utilize Tiger Connect as much as we can. Um, I have literally gone up to each nurse and I make sure I help them download the Tiger Connect and I help them to download their name and their flow number. So whenever you're trying to reach them, I've already sent you pictures where you see the LED screen and you know which patient is being taken care of by which nurse. And that's not the only one. When you go to the unit secretary, there is a folder that has a nurse's name and the room number she's taking care of. So the survey that I took, the most common answer from us residents was that you could not figure out which nurse is taking care of which patient. So LED and folder is the answer to that. Now the next is how to reach out to them. We are still in the process of getting 100% Tiger Connect used by at least the 44, 4500. It'll take me another maybe few weeks. Um, but a lot of them still do have it. And I have instructed them when they save their name to mention 44 or 4500 next to them. So what you do is, when you look at the LED screen and you have, let's say, Kayla, and there's, uh, you know, what you do is you either can search for Kayla, and let's say if you, the, you see five Kaylas, you'll see like um, the floor number mentioned next to them. And that's how you text them, okay? And this is not just my QR project, this is for all of us. This is just for your life to be easier and for their life to be easier. So wherever you see nurses, if they don't have Tiger Connect, please encourage them to use it and tell them like we don't want to bother you while you're in the middle of something and you have to run and pick up the calls and you're on hold for us or we are on hold for you. This is like a group thing that's be that's going to improve everyone's process of communication, okay? Um, so please encourage use of Tiger Connect. Help them download. It's going to take two minutes if you have it. And especially 44, 4500, you have a nurse. Please practice. You search 44, 4500, I assure you. For now, we have at least, I cannot say really 60, but about 50% of the nurses who use Tiger Connection 4445. But over the next few weeks, hoping we can go up to 100%. So that's about my QI project. And um, also, one of the concerns, when I did the nursing survey, the biggest issue they had with our communication was with the course. So make sure we mention our first names. That's the major thing that I've heard about. And the second in their survey was that whenever we pick up the call, we do not introduce by our name, and we need to. I know the survey that I did, we were like, okay, we say our name and our team and everything, but if we are not guys, please do say your name very clearly so they know who they are talking to, and so they know if they are telling an order to put in, they know which name to put under, okay? So that is about my QI. So LED screens, folders, target connect, main things, okay? That's for us to do, but on them I'll do other interventions. So you can do these, these. Okay. Right, left, right, left, right, left. The Thank pointer you. doesn't work for these. Okay, that's fine. Right, left, right, left. I think I might still okay. okay. I feel like there's already been a lot of this regarding Tiger Do you guys see any improvement with yes. Tiger Connect yeah. somewhat? Yeah. Again, for, search for, for, for the floor numbers. That's how the lists of the nurses will come by. You Even now... Using that number that comes on the screen, that really helps. Yes. Which number? There is a big LED screen. Yes. I sent the picture on the group, right? Yes. There's a name of the nurse, yes. the patient's initials. You know something you don't know what these letters mean? That those are the patient initials they're taking care of. And they even have signs of like who's on fall precautions and all those things. I've mentioned it on the group, I can send it again. So once you know their names, instead of calling them, please can I talk to this nurse and you're on okay. hold for 15 minutes, just find their name, try to connect them, they'll, they'll reach back to you, okay? Does it mention the nurse's first, last name and first name both? Or just? One? They have their first name and last initial, but I asked them to mention their floor numbers. On the time connect? Yes. So if you now look, go to your Tri Connect, you look for 4400, you'll see all the nurses that have Tri Connect with 4400. So you search when you send a text. So, like, uh, so please, nurses, please make sure some, you use this. Some nurses like 2100 ER, they mention, but when you open the, uh, like any nurse, there is no number for 4400. No, no, when you search. I think you have to do a presentation on this too. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can do it. No, no, I, I want to make sure you all know. So, you go to 
this you create a message yeah. here, right? Yeah. You guys you know there's an editing mm -hmm. sending message, you search here, enter name. Let's say you don't know the name. You know it's some let's say Katie, right? But it's on forty four hundred. So you do forty four hundred. You have all these nurses who work on 4400 that have tried to connect. Yeah. And then you know, okay, I see Katie who works on 4400, and then you text them, okay? Or sometimes they work on both 44 and 45. If 44 is not working, you can try 4500. If this is not working, just try typing your name. Okay. Anything else to improve communication with the nurses? Mm -hmm. I think this was our major issue, right? To figure out who's taking care of who and what's the better way to reach out to them. Your QI project has helped us a lot. Really? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Really? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's working? It's working. That's good. That's good. I, um, even the nursing managers are really helping me with this, on, just on the 44 though. Mm -hmm. But they, they are also being proactive with the tire connect use. And I think our main thing was to figure out the LED thing. Okay, uh, you know the folder that they have at the unit, that the, at the desk? It is updated every morning at 6 a.m. So you can't be like, oh, I was here and the, it is right there, it's open. It's right there, all you have to do is just peek in, that's all. So let's please start doing that if you cannot figure out the LED stuff. And if each resident helps one nurse to download and use Tire Connect, it will really not only help me but all of us. Trust me. We should do like Bing Mo. Like if you make somebody do it. Yeah. Can I erase mine then? Yes. <laughs> Guys, please, if you can, take out one, two minutes in one year of your residency to help one nurse to download Tire Connect. Please. <laughs> And make sure to guide them if they're if they're downloading it under your settings and account when you make an account there's a place where they write RN and next to that guide them to put in 24 2500 or 34 3500 or whatever okay medical student I think they want us to make a match or something like that. Yeah, match date, different match date. I'm going to text Shiva. I don't think they're... Do we have the list of the match? No, not yet. Okay. This guy is very high. What do we do? The first one. The first one. The second one. Yeah, we are here. Huh? Yeah, they were just here.
guys we were eagerly waiting for you all to join us um, this is uh, the medical student lectures that we 30 years you know do to educate more on the common topics that we see and is dr. Hollis coming today do we know okay all right so today's topic is UTI and before I go to next slides I would want to make it much more interactive and there's no pressure I'm not gonna pick up anyone but we're going to start with the med students and we'll move to the first year, second year, third years, then myself, if I know the answer. <laughs> and then um, however the APDs want to contribute. Um, so UTIs, so the topics that we're going to discuss here is the definition of epidemiology, the causes, the risk factors, how do we treat them, all the types, uh, what happens if we don't treat them. Um, I forgot to mention one more thing, prevention. Um, so this is what we're going to discuss. So what is UTI? The simplest question, med students, please throw in, jump in. UTIs? No? First years? Urinary tract. Urinary, exactly. Infection of any urinary tract. What is urinary tract? Med students? Kidneys. <laughs> Kidneys, ureters. Kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra, right? So any infection that's happening over there is UTI. Um, then is, what do you think? How common is UTI? Who do you see it more? What is the more prevalence like? Any ideas? Women, yes. Uh, correct uh-huh what else pregnancy. pregnancy what else what kind of UTI do you think is more common in women and what kind is more common in men uncomplicated so like based on anatomical cystitis. location cystitis, cystitis. cystitis. cystitis and Okay, we'll figure that out. What about in men? Prostatitis. Prostatitis. Prostatitis and urethritis. Is urethritis UTI, really? Eh, kind of, obviously, urethra is a part of ut uh, our urinary tract. But it is mainly urethritis is when, the, uh, when mainly the STD infections kind of take into picture. So that is urethritis, okay? Um, so I'll quickly go over epidemiology. So 9 million doctor visits a year. If you go to clinic, if you're working inpatient, you will for sure see multiple UTIs in your day. Um, out of that, COTIs account for 40% of healthcare associated infections. What are COTIs? Catheter associated urinary tract infections. What catheters? Pyruvic? No. Cath the Foley's, right? Something more, that's more indwelling or suprapubic. Women are at greater risk of, because of obvious reasons, shorter urethra and obviously shorter distance from NS to urethra as the picture demonstrates. Approximately half of all women experience a UTI by the age of 30. And in women, UTIs are mostly cystitis or pyelonephritis. 
and in men, UTIs are mainly prostatitis and urethritis. Risk factors. <laughs> I'm gonna let. I'm gonna give you a little peek in. But what do you think risk factors? Uh, Sumit had mentioned pregnancy, so that's one. Sexual activity. <laughs> Sexual activity. What else? Sports and sports. Sports. Okay. Instrumentation. Instrumentation. Yes. Renal stones. Some sort of obstruction, something that's causing stagnant <coughs> flow. What else? Okay. I'll, I'll do the med students first and then we'll come to the first years. Um, so, what are the risk factors? Chronic constipation. Yes, anatomical. Mm -hmm. What else? <coughs> Any sort of vesico, correct. Anything that's causing the stagnant is allowing them to germinate and the bacteria to colonize and everything. Okay. So common causes risk factors, sexual activity like we discussed, structural and functional abnormalities like the vesico-urethral that you mentioned, spermicidal agents and diaphragms, pregnancy, diabetes, immunosuppression, obesity, urethral catheterization, some sort of voiding dysfunction like the when there's more uh, post-voidal residual left, and very something that I didn't know was genetic and family history. So this also has to play a role. Um, pathophysiology. Why do you think UTI happens? Med students. I'm sorry? Like an ascending infection. From? From outside source. Okay. E. coli is the most common organism, right? And we are close to, to the uh, enteral bacteria, right? Because of the rectum and the anus being there. So ascending is one. So do all the UTIs happen because of ascending infection? What do you think? Mostly it is ascending, right? Something has to go some um, upwards to cause the infection. Which UTI is cannot always be ascending? Correct. Yes. Which one? Pyelonephritis. Yes. Pylo is something that you can get even with hematogenous suppression, not necessarily ascending. Okay. Uh, colonization, then the uroepithelial uh, penetration, then ascension, then pyelonephritis. This is the one that can happen with hematogenous, and it can cause AKI. So we always, you know, diagnose AKI because of UTI, because at some point some parenchyma tubular structures are also affected. Okay. Sorry, my presentation is. So most infections occur by ascending route. Ninety-five percent of, of, of ascending infections are caused by single species bacteria mainly the gram-negative bacilli and mainly E. coli. E. coli accounts for 75 to 95 percent of UTIs in women. Less common pathogens include enterobacteriaceae, strept, entero, and staph. Why staph? First, uh, medical students. Would you encounter staph UTI? I know E. coli gram-negative is sure. You know, they colonize everywhere, but if you see, you do a urine culture, you see staph. What are you worried about? That's okay. That's all right. First years. Where is it coming from? Bacteremia. Bacteremia. So something is happening in your blood. That's why it's in the urine, right? And mainly, what are we majorly concerned about is endocarditis, especially if the person is in shock. We cannot find a source. What's going on? That's when we think of staph and UTI. Okay. So we cannot just be like, okay, this is just a contaminant, especially if it's MRSA or something. Um, UTIs occurring in healthcare settings involve organisms such as Enterobacter, Providencia, Marginella, Citrobacter, Serratia, Pseudomonas, and um, staph aureus isolation in urine may be related to the instrumentation, but suggest a possible hematogenous infection from an external source such as endocarditis. Categories, types, classifications. Med students, what do you think? How do we classify UTIs? Is there one type of classification? Are there multiple? Do we need to classify them? Do we need to classify them? First question. Yes. Do we need to classify them? Why? Yes. We need to classify them because different classification will have different duration, antibiotics, and all those things, right? So we need to classify them. And how do we classify them? It could be based on location, right? It could be lower, it could be upper. Mm -hmm. 
It could be based on your severity of illness, which is what? Complicated. complicated and uncomplicated. And then these are really not the categories, but I just mentioned it uh, because it's recurrent and catheter associated. So these are the different kinds. Okay. Is it acute and chronic as well, or no? Do we use that? Acute and chronic is mainly for bacterial prostatitis. Okay, but not chronic. But not really acute or no. Okay. Recurrent is one thing, but we're going to cover that. Okay. So we have anatomical types. So um, lower is anything that's occurring at or beyond the bladder, um, which is cystitis, and in, in urethra, it'll be urethritis and prostatitis in men. And anything that's above the bladder is going to be pyelonephritis, pyelonephritis, ureteritis, okay? I didn't mention it here, but if they're stoned, they're less likely, but that can happen too. Next is complicated versus uncomplicated. So what do you all think? What is complicated and uncomplicated? I'll go with med students. Just take a guess. In men. Could yes. What else? Why in men is complicated? So something in the uti is not simple. Something is complicating it, right? What are those contributing factors for it to be complicated? Yes, structural issues. Something is not right. Maybe the you know the functional issues or the structure. It was not the anatomy was not formed properly. That could be. What else? Why in men? Why is it called complicated in men? And why not women? Yeah, they're not as likely to get it. They're not supposed to get it because of the longer urethra. There are less risk factors, so yes. So when I was doing making this presentation, my resources are up to date and mix up. So if you guys want any information, you can refer to that. But when I was reading both, I think it is an older classification. If it's a complicated, um, if it is uncomplicated, it's a UTI that refers to infections in non-pregnant patients without any structural or neurological abnormalities or comorbidities. Um, and then complicated UTIs are associated with men, pregnancy, foreign bodies, any sort of uh, catheters, calculi, kidney disease, immunocompromise from obstruction or urinary retention from whatever issues or recent antibiotic use. However, this is what we know of. However, when you go to UpToDate and you see the recent up-to-date information, basically what it says is any UTI can be complicated if it is causing any systemic issues. Systemic meaning fever, sepsis, rigors, chills, you know, all kind of, kinds of things. And anything can be un uncomplicated if you just have barely symptoms and you're doing fine otherwise. Um, and it also covers one more thing that if it is below the bladder, it's more likely uncomplicated. Anything above it, which includes <coughs> pyelonephritis, is always going to be complicated, okay? Did it make sense? So, but this is what we go with, with the up-to-date um, knowledge that we have. Um, so uncomplicated, presumed to be confined to the bladder, no signs and symptoms that suggest an upper tract or systemic infection. Complicated UTI has signs and symptoms that suggest extension of infection beyond the bladder and fever, chills, rigors, malaise, flank pain, CV angle, tenderness, pelvic or perineal pain in men. This is very important because in the previous slide we saw men complicated. However, according to this, if men have pelvic and perineal pain, that is when it's complicated, okay? So evaluation, um, you co patient comes, what are you, what's your HNP like? What do you ask for? What are the symptoms you encounter? Burning urination, painful urination, what else? First years. I don't want to ignore this group too. I want to involve them too. Increased frequency, urgency. Frequency, urgency. And? Maybe Yeah. So any, any of those. Yeah, so in physical exam, how do you test cost over red angle tenderness? You do this and you do this, right? But which patients will we see the cost of vertebral tenderness? Pylo. Would pylo people present with your, uh, this dysuria and burning urination and all those things? What do you think? No, right, exactly. When they present, they're mainly like systemic stuff, right? They'll be mainly having chills, rigors, and all those things. So dysuria, like we mentioned, suprapubic pain, fever, chills, CV angle tenderness, suprapubic pain or tenderness. Especially here in patient, when you see all these people in ICU, they probably are in some sort of 
not intubated and sedated really, but on some sort of pain meds, um, or like they're not there, that's make sure you touch the suprapubic area and you make sure that they're not tender over there. Um, for labs, most females with suspected acute simple cystitis, especially with classic signs and symptoms, which is all this this year and everything, no additional testing is warranted to make the diagnosis. So if you're outpatient, a female comes in, I have burning da 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 da, you don't have to do all the testing, the urine culture, the, all those things. It's a simple cystitis and you just treat it empirically, okay? You don't need to do cultures, so please remember that. And, but if you're like more complicated people, you do CBC, CMP, urine analysis, and they're on. So urine analysis is done by microscopy and dipstick. What is the difference between these two? What do you think? First years. <coughs> Can microscopy test that? How do we do dipstick? Do you guys know? <coughs> Correct, it's a strip. It has reagents in it. You dip it in the urine and whatever it's present, it'll show a color change, okay? Um, pyuria is what? What is pyuria? WBCs in urine, right? Does pyuria always mean infection? No. So we're gonna read that later. So ideally, you know, it was very interesting when I was reading this, the likelihood of detecting a bladder bacteria by voided urine is highest if urine is collected upon arising. So if you wake up in the morning and then you do it, that's, that's the best. And also in a normal individual sample obtained by suprapubic aspiration of bladder is sterile and does not contain leukocytes and is actually a, a gold standard for diagnosing UTI. <laughs> but obviously we cannot poke everyone on their bladder and take out the urine sample, right? But this, none of this is practical, but I just wanted to add in. So urine collection and testing, we do clean catch and midstream. Midstream, how do we do midstream? We allow the first half or the first one third to go by, then we check the middle that has, that is being voided. Um, for chronic bacterial prostatitis in men, the way we uh, do it is we do the prosthetic massage and that is when you get the accurate um, testing done. Dipsticks will show leukocyte esterase. What is leukocyte esterase? What is leukocyte esterase? It's an enzyme, right? Where does it come from? Leukocytes, exactly. So uh, on the dipstick, if um, you see leukocyte esterase that corresponds to pi urea, and pi urea is defined as more than 10 is 2 should be five. leukocytes per mic leader. Um, and then another thing that the dipsticks test is nitrite test. What is nitrites? Yes. So they have nitrite reductase which converts into urine nitrate to nitrites. Yes, and that's what it picks up. So you have gotten the urine collection. Let's say you're in the ER, you have a nurse who's collecting the urine. How do you test it? What happens next? We put in orders and we go and do whatever, right? What happens after that? Sample do we keep it? Do we warm it? Do we freeze it? What do we do? Normal temperature? What do you all think? Normal temperature? Urine in normal temperature? Warm or frozen or what do we do? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Microwave. Microwave. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is something that I did not know and I was reading upon this and we are like, you know, sometimes we're in that automatic mode, we're just doing whatever and we never really think about what happens when they collect the specimen. So, it should be sent immediately to the lab and should not be allowed to be in room temperature because the bacterial proliferation happens. But what if you are um, asked to take a sample at home and then bring it the next day? Then what do you do? Microwave it? No. <laughs> no. So what you do is the container should be transported in an iced water and then stored in the refrigerator at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? So um, and the same thing goes with the home sample. Either you are you know, delayed the, the processing or you have to do it at home. So this is what happens with urine collection and testing. 
and just some few points here. In truly infected patients, a signal on that catheter, and when is the time for them to change it, basically? Four to six weeks? Less than the Yeah. I think it depends on the type, right? Can go up to three months. Yeah. Some of them last up to two weeks. Three months. Three months. Three months. Three months. Three months. Technically, to actually prevent infections, it should be two weeks. Yeah. To be changed every two weeks. However, we don't do that. Um, uh, but that's, that's what the number is. Um, so that was catheter associated. So we do urine analysis, culture, and um, sensitivity. We remove the catheter and replace only if needed. And you guys, whenever we put a catheter in, we need to follow the indications. We cannot just put a catheter in just because, you know. Um, you have to have strong indications. Why? Is, is there like chronic obstruction? Did you try the intermittent cath and all those things? So you want to make sure when you do the catheter. Um, removal is strongly recommended for catheters in place for more than two weeks. Treat for five to seven days if symptoms resolve promptly or longer. Uh, for patients with delayed response and take preventive measures. What are the preventive measures I'm talking about? Limited voiding, drinking more water. Yes, so people who have catheter, sterile techniques, you have to make the condition sterile whenever you change it, make sure your gloves, hands are washed, and all those conservative things, okay? Obviously, we've got to treat these things because of, if we don't, bacteremia, sepsis, organ failure, shock, renal failure and in pregnancy, uh, fetal and maternal complications in occur. So we cannot take UTIs lightly and we gotta treat them. How do we prevent them? Can we prevent the UTIs? How? It's taking so much toll, right? So many visits, so many antibiotics, so much resistance. How can we prevent the UTIs? <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on who. If you have someone who has like recurrent UTIs or, and you have structural mm -hmm. problems, you can give suppressive antibiotics. Right, so if you, have a, if you have a root cause, fix that. Mm -hmm. If you have a catheter, make sure you follow the sterile techniques and you change it every two weeks. What else? Does cranberry juice help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Does vitamin C help? Does drinking water help? Yes. Yes. Water helps, yes. Water helps. With cranberry and the, uh, what was the other one? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. Vitamin C. Vitamin C. No, no, no. Um, limited problem. evidence. Yeah. But if nothing is working, sure, what's a cranberry going to do, right? Maybe protect. <laughs> 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 so it's not really evidence based, but whatever works. And then um, what about post coital voiding? Does that help? Yes. Limited evidence. <laughs> it can, it may not. Um, and what about like the wiping techniques? Good. Back to front, front to back. The wiping techniques with the toilet paper. <laughs> Does that help? Yes. Logically, yes. yes. Evidence based, I don't know. <laughs> so, so that's one. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you know when you work in the uh, in the outpatient setting, you see a lot of frequently a lot of women being on estrogen and stuff, right? The estrogen creams and blah blah blah. Obviously, it's for vaginal dryness and everything, but that can actually help with the prevention of the UTI. Okay. So birth control is one. Spermicides, especially those who use diaphragm, if you change that, these can cause UTI. Over-the-counter products, cranberry juice, and a supplement called Demanus. Menos, okay, it, this doesn't have an evidence. Drinking more fluids, good. Urinating after intercourse, eh, no evidence. Postmenopausal, estrogen, sterile measures and self-treatment. Sterile measures, like I talked, wiping. Self-treatment is what? The things that we just talked about, right? Either postcoital antibiotics or prophylaxis. If you feel symptoms, you can just take it. So I think that is about it. What? Do ID? <laughs> I wanna. I just wanna be an internal medicine. Will you guys have any questions? Anything I did wrong or said wrong? Please follow up on up to date and mix up. Okay, and then let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.
You can use that pointer. I'm so bad. I knew it was really Is it going to be one hour? Hmm? I know, right? I'll just take it. How was it? Did you get I'll try to finish it quick. Okay. <laughs> but I'll need to discuss like the question as you guys did and then what data you obtained. Just totally opposite. And then what question as you felt guys felt it. How it improved in first 45 days. <laughs> and then compared to how how we improved, we improved, but we're still below the target range. Did you go through the whole stack? Yeah. So you know about it. How I collected data. <laughs> I'll try to finish part. I'm working with you, same because you saw don't take care of Thank <laughs> you. 
I need to start. I need to work on my punch up. What can I be with you guys for three years? I want to know a word. Before I yeah, I mean, then same, you know same, same to you, same to you, bro. And do you know what you're doing? Yeah, that's what they told me. Yeah. 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 You see, right? Trust you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It means I'm the singer who sang this. He was like Spanish, murdered, very. Oh, okay. All right, guys, should we start then? Yes, it's it. Yes. How many slides? It's, it's mostly data slide, so it will be very quick. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with this, okay? So this is a quality improvement project. This is very important. So every time, whatever you're gonna work with, whether you're gonna work as a hospitalist, whether you're gonna work as a primary care, you will always have a patient in your list with a COPD exacerbation, irrespective. So this study. So we will collect all the evidence, whatever we have from uh, European Respiratory Society, American Thoracic Society, what all evidence. So I have put in multiple studies to show what the difference is. And then uh, we did a questionnaire. And how did your questionnaire reflect in your data? And then I collected data for three months. So first 45 days before we didn't know, and then 45 days after. So it was total 90 days, so we split it into 45 days. And how the questionnaire and repeated uh, education improved our uh, results. But still, we are away from the goal, but I'll talk everything about it. So the, in the questionnaire, you guys have mentioned that you know a lot of stuff regarding COPD. You have received a lot of education. So this question is for, before we start, this question is for interns. <laughs> so any intern, what's the definition, like what's the full form of gold? We always say COPD gold stage four gold stage. So this is for Namni. What's the full form of gold? Because you guys have mentioned in your survey that you guys know a lot about COPD. <laughs> Global Initiative for Lung Disease. For Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. So what do they say? What does WHO say about COPD exacerbation? We'll just immediately go through it. So basically COPD exacerbation, so gold uh, a report produced by National Health, Lung and Blood Institute, NWHO, defines exacerbation of COPD as an acute event characterized by worsening of patients' respiratory symptoms that is beyond normal day-to-day -day variations and leads to change in medications. So this generally includes acute changes in one of the following cardinal symptoms. Cuff increase in symptom and severity, sputum and sputum production increases and dyspnea. So how, why it is so important and why our QI project is so important? Because these COPD exacerbations have a negative impact on quality of life of patients, accelerate disease progression and can result in hospital admissions and death. So in COPD exacerbation basically we manage three things, right? So Manish, what are those three things which we manage? COPD. Exacerbation. So we start, uh, one is breathing treatment. So three components, yeah. yeah. And then uh, we give uh, steroids treatment and uh, antibiotics. Good. So basically most common trigger for COPD exacerbation is underlying infection which we cover with antibiotics. Bronchos, second component is bronchospasm, which we cover with bronchodilators. And third is inflammation, which we cover with steroids. And depending on the severity, we have underlying uh, goal stages. And then depending on the severity of disease, we give uh, steroids, okay? So treatment, important step in initial evaluation is to determine whether the patient needs hospitalization or safely can be managed at home. We don't see much of an outpatient exposure here, but still 80% of the patients of COPD are managed in the outpatient settings itself, in the office or an emergency department. If the exacerbation appears life-threatening or if there are indications for a ventilator support, the patient should be admitted to ICU as quickly as possible. So always, always COPD exacerbations, 
This is just for your educational purpose. If patient is drowsy, always get an ABG. First, because what topic, sir? First, what's your topic? So my topic is quality improvement, IV versus oral steroids. <coughs> so home management of COPD exacerbation generally includes whatever I discussed with you, because three components we have to cover. For bronchospasm, intensification of bronchodilator therapy, initiation of a course of oral glucocorticoids, and oral antibiotics are added based on individual characteristics. Similar to home, at home management, the major components of emergency department or in hospital include reversing the airflow, limit, airflow limitation with bronchodilators, glucocorticoids, treating underlying infection, ensuring appropriate oxygenation, and averting intubation and mechanical ventilation. So what is recommended? This is very important now. So for patients requiring ER or hospital treatment for COPD exacerbation, we recommend a course of systemic glucocorticoids. We all know this. So oral glucocorticoids are rapidly absorbed with the serum uh, levels achieved at one hour after ingestion with virtually complete bioavailability and appears equally efficacious to IV glucocorticoids for treating most exacerbations of COPD. In a systemic review, parental glucocorticoids were compared to oral glucocorticoids and no systemic differences were noted in the primary outcomes of treatment failure. We'll discuss what are treatment failures, what is relapse, what is mortality, and what are the adverse effects. So in IV glucocorticoids are typically administered to patients who present with severe exacerbations who have not responded to oral glucocorticoids at home, who are unable to take oral medications, who may not have, who may not have proper absorption due to decreased plankton perfusion. So now I will talk about all the studies. The evidence-based studies from American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, and various other studies published and which tells out what's the difference between oral and IV steroids. Before going there, there's one study conducted in US this was, I think, I mentioned it in the further slides. This study was done. We showed that, in, which I think, studied more than 80,000 patients. They said that the, most of the physicians in the US, about 80 to 90 percent, prefer doing IV steroids. So we'll see what, what it is. So, what is uh, American Thoracic Society uh, and European Respiratory Society say? So, first of all, uh, optimal dose of systemic glucocorticoids for pa treating a COPD exacerbation is unknown. Still, patient factors never to be ignored. As I discuss in our monthly mortality meet, always every patient respect each patient's individual characteristics and the underlying comorbidities and severity of disease. Always keep in that mind. But still, what goal guide sorry. Goal guidelines advise using equivalent of prednisone 40 once daily for the majority of COPD exacerbations. So it's prednisone 40. Frequently used regimens are prednisone 30 to 60 milligram once daily. To methyl prednisolone, which is you most commonly see, solumedrol, which is solumedrol, 60 to 125, two to four times, depending on the severity of exacerbation. A growing body of evidence favors using a moderate rather than a high dose of glucocorticoids for most patients with COPD exacerbation. This is the duration. How much duration is required according to both American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society? The study was done in 2017. Sorry. And gold guidelines. Gold guidelines say five days. European Respiratory Society, American Thoracic Society says 14 days. So to be on the safer range, try to have this much in your clinical practice, 5 to 14 days. So even a short course of glucocorticoids are, in, uh, systemic glu are increased with, associated with increased risk of harm. So that's why you should not blindly give 125 Q6 of solumetrol. It's always respect patient's characteristics. Why? These are the various risk factors, but this is just a few of IV glucocorticoids or IV any steroids, hyperglycemia, pneumonia, sepsis, venous thromboembolism, fractures. So this was one, the, one of the most important study in which one of the question was this, they, every time they come up with different guidelines. So there are six or seven questionnaires they discuss during the society meetings. So this one was one of the study in 2017, where they said, they said should IV or oral corticosteroids be used to treat patients who are hospitalized with COPD exacerbation. This was one focus on one question. So here they say that there's evidence supporting the use of systemic corticosteroids with severe exacerbations of COPD treated in the hospital. No doubt about that. Controlling the inflammation is the most important part. Second, high IV dose steroids for admitted patients with severe exacerbations may not have a higher efficacy compared to oral and can potentially be harm, can cause more side effects. Therefore, we search for evidence comparing both routes of administration of corticosteroids in this population of patients. 
So this was a small study. Uh, trials in 250 patients hospitalized with COPD exacerbations. One trial randomized 210 hospitalized patients with COPD exacerbation to receive either 60 IV of IV prednisone plus or comparing with placebo or oral prednisone plus intravenous placebo for five days. Both groups received oral prednisone taper following five days. And similarly, there was another one, oral trial, uh, other trial, which assigned 40 patients to receive either 32 mg per kg of oral methylprednisone or, for, or 1 mg per kg dose of IV methylprednisone for four, dose, for four days, followed by 0.5 mg of intravenous methylprednisone for three days. So let's see the results. So basically, task force identified five primary outcomes, what we discussed. Treatment failure, which was death. Admission and readmission to ICU, which we see sometimes in our patients. Intensification of pharmacological therapy. We start with 40. There were many patients, especially when I was triaging in January, where we started with 40, we had to go up because of the underlying lung disease. Mortality, readmission to the hospital, length of hospital stay, and time for next UPD exacerbation. So what are, when they pooled the results, though this was the treatment failure. In case of IV steroids, it was more. So mortality also comparatively more, hospital readmissions more. So length of hospital stay also was more in IV. So uh, and one trial demonstrated an increased risk of mild adverse effects in the IV corticosteroids. I won't go into detail into numbers. So this is just to prove that there's a strong evidence of using oral. So among outcomes that are known to be improved by corticosteroids, that is reduced treatment failure, there were 